After 10 years of counselling, one of the things that jumps out at me the most is just how much time we spend chasing down a sense of worthiness and a sense of connection. Every day we set off out to prove ourselves yet again. And we do this over and over and over. It's kind of like our default setting, isn't it? And it, and it can be a bit like, a, it, some days it can be an okay journey and another day it can be like a journey through quicksand. One moment I'm feeling connected and I'm feeling worthy and then somebody says something or does something or I see something and I immediately disconnect or I stop feeling so worthy. One of the things that I ask my clients when they come to see me is to list five things that they really like about themselves. And 99% of them have trouble getting to three. Conversely, when I ask them to name me five things that they don't like about my, them, themselves, they have no trouble getting to five pretty quickly. So when I challenge them about this, there really is no substance to most of their claims. It's kind of like these things are simply not true. So to give you a, an idea of what's on the list, it's things like I'm not tough enough, I'm not bright enough, I'm not good looking enough. I'm not a good enough husband, I'm not a good enough parent, uh, I'm too needy, I'm too angry, I'm too loud, I'm too lazy, I'm invisible, I'm divorced, I'm lonely, I'm bored, I'm stubborn, I'm tired, it's things like that and the list goes on and on and on. And on top of that, there's sort of most rapport having this feeling of being like a fraud and that they worry that it's only a matter of time before they get found out. So generally this all centers around the feeling of not being good enough. So why do we hang on to that notion? The, the notion that these things are true. What is in it for us to maintain this as our status quo? when clearly it's causing us a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety. And those of us working in the healthcare area are now well aware of the strong correlation between the mind and the body. And there's no getting around it anymore. And as a society, I think that we're hurting terribly. And I think that this wound of disconnection is what I call it, seems to be just getting greater. And we see this manifest as depression and anxiety, addiction, bullying, blaming, um, and isolating, and, and a whole host of other illnesses and health issues. So back to the question of why. Why are we acting and thinking like these negative things about us are true? Well, my experience tells me that it's primarily shame. There may well be other contributing factors, but I would say shame seems to be the bedrock. And it's a bedrock um, on which we have unwittingly programmed our lives. And research now shows us that shame is not just the domain of those who have suffered major abuse or trauma. And for me, I guess that's where I initially thought that it's where shame hung out, but certainly not anymore. In all my years of counselling, I would say without exception, almost without exception, let's put it that way, that everybody I have seen has had some level of shame. And that it's like this invisible shape shifter. And it has an effect on every decision that you make. Every decision you make about how you relate, every decision that you make about who you love and how you love, every decision that you make as a parent, every decision that you make about how you work, where you work, what you work as, every decision that we make about ourselves and how we see ourselves fitting into our community. Shame hijacks 
our sense of worthiness. And in doing so, it lays the groundwork for us to build walls around ourselves. And we have to learn how to do this and to survive without that essential core part of ourselves that was shamed into silence at the beginning. And we achieve this through learning judgment and judgment of ourselves and judgment of others, perfecting ourselves, perfecting others and numbing ourselves. And we numb ourselves through behaviours such as um, addiction, work, sex, adrenaline chasing, eating, prescription medications uh, and anger is also something that we can use. And once built, these walls have to be maintained and they have to be manned and, and we have to do this almost like 24-7. And that in itself is exhausting and it's unrelenting. And it can manifest as any number of the illnesses that I've mentioned above. So what is the genesis of shame? Well, it would take much more than the scope of this video to explain that. But in a nutshell, it's a family of origin, a primary caregiver kind of thing. It's intergenerational, it's community based. It's in our education system, our legal system thrives on it, our boardrooms and corporations peddle it, and our government legislates it, and every day our media reinforces it, I think. So, in the words of a client of mine, we are marinating in it. There's no escaping it. Fundamentally, we are a shame-based society. And part of being in a shame-based society is the belief that vulnerability is weakness. And I think that's a deadly belief and, and it causes a lot of harm and it causes a lot of heartache. This is not to say that we can't go through our day-to-day -day lives functioning well because we can and, and we do. This is more about the quality of that functioning and the quality of the life that you have and that you have now, not in a week, not when the kids have left home, not when you've lost 10 kilos, not when you find a partner, not when you get rid of the partner that you have, not when you've paid off the mortgage, but right now. And it's about the balance that you have in your life. Are you working and resting and playing with some kind of balance? And lastly, it's about the foundation that underpins the inner you. Is it solid or is it like a house of cards? Shame thrives on silence and secrecy and it will continue to blindside us until we learn to spot it on our radars. But first we need to download a new radar. And this version will have software that is programmed into it by you that will be able to identify a shame troll at 500 paces. And eventually with practice, you will be able to neutralize that shame troll and walk away with um, some of your dignity, all of your dignity still intact. So where to from here? The first step is, I think, acknowledging that there's some truth in this video that's speaking to the inner you. The second is to weigh up the fear or, and discomfort of change versus the fear and discomfort of staying trapped where you are. According to Brené Brown, one of Shane's great triumphs is to corrode that very part of us that believes that we are capable of change. That's part of its power over us. To me, that's like it's saying, if you expose me, I will expose you. And that is our deepest fear, isn't it? One of the remarkable things that I get to see when working with people is to watch them gathering up 
their courage to go knocking on the door of shame. And they're expecting huge trouble with a capital T. But instead what they find is that core part of themselves that got lost along the way. And that's the part that can help us change. So to me the challenge is to dare greatly and give it a go. And I want to say that there is a consensus that we never really free ourselves 100% um, from shame. But with courage and commitment and a connection to those working with shame, we can learn to neutralise it and we can learn to neutralise its effect on us. And that puts a whole lot of ease and a whole lot of relief back into our lives. And then that in turn has the ability to orientate us towards being able to live a much more wholehearted kind of life.